Hello and welcome once again to White Lotus of Light conversational series. I am really excited. I've uh, been planning this a while with Tom. I am so thrilled uh, and happy to have Tom Siebert here. So Tom used to work on Madison Avenue. He was a um, film critic for many years. He kind of still does that. Um, he's a theology scholarship guy who earned a film degree. He's a symbologist, a deocultist. Uh, cautious practitioner of Christian magic, and he's been called dangerous more than once. Um, and so I discovered Tom uh, quite a few months ago. Someone suggested him to me because uh, Tom talks quite a lot, and this is going to be one of the basically the primary focus of our conversation. He talks quite a lot about revelation of the method, and so I'm going to let uh, Tom uh, launch into that, and then I'm going to kind of uh, take my esoteric magical perspective on it. And we're going to talk about a whole host of interesting things today. But to just to start out of the gate, Tom, how are you doing today, brother? Are you doing well? I'm doing very well, Ian. Thank you. I'm I'm uh, pleased to be here. Oh, fantastic! So, um, Tom, I'm just going to tee it up a little bit here for you. So, revelation of the method. Um, I'm going to get into my take on it. I talk about it a lot on my channel. I think it's actually one of the very poorly understood um, terms. I think a lot of people misuse it and end up ironically kind of helping uh, the the dark sorcerers, the, the group I call the Malachians. I feel that they uh, end up helping them by a, a slight misunderstanding of revelation of the method. But it essentially works like this just to super boil it down. And then I want you to launch into it and then go as deep as you like. Um, the dark sorcerers will want to do something. Uh, and so they will hide it, encode it, uh, put it in usually in some kind of ritualistic or symbolic form into films, into music videos. They really love that one. There's a reason for that. And things like the classic example that I always use that is the single most obvious revelation of the method black magic ritual in history, as far as I know, which is the opening ceremony of the 2012 Olympic Games, uh, where they forecasted. Uh, the COVID operation and launched a very potent black magic uh, spell that leads us to the situation we're in where um, it looks to me that we're in the midst of uh, a fifth generation warfare war that is psych primarily psychological in nature. And so, Tom, tell us tell us about Revelation of the Method and uh, just if you want to give an overview of it beyond what I just said. And then I would love to talk some of the examples because we both are big uh John Carpenter fans, and so yes. he, he, he put out a lot of stuff about that. So, Tom, please. Uh, certainly, and I think the the key point that you made uh, on that introduction is that the revelation of the method is a type of psychological warfare on the masses. Yes. Uh, and it uh, is basically what it says in the title. It's a revelation. It reveals the method in which these things were done and it's usually a traumatic event of some sort something that uh influences the entire population um uh that seems to have sinister subtext beneath it uh and the revelation of the method is the gradual revealing of that sinister undertone uh and as you also kind of alluded to it's broken down into three parts uh, there is what's called the predictive programming, where they show you what's going to happen ahead of time. And this is usually put in films or television shows, uh, books, theater, uh, movies pretty much get the, the brunt of it now because they're the easiest to track down and to, to show on YouTube videos or reference in books through photos. Uh, then there is the event itself which is uh, uh, the second part of the revelation of the method where the event actually takes place. And while the second event is taking place, the third portion of it kicks in right away or kicks in at that moment, which is the freeze thaw portion of the revelation of the method. While the event is taking place, there's all sorts of shady stuff going on, just like there was at 9-11 or with the JFK assassination or with COVID or any of these big mass trauma events, while they're happening, there's strange things that don't add up, but the fact of the incongruity is frozen. That's the frozen part of the freeze-thaw uh, strategy. And then as time passes after the event, 
the frozen part is gradually thawed where the revelations of the method of what actually happened on the event are gradually revealed to the public. Uh, and, you know, we've seen this through the JFK assassination over the years. All this stuff gradually comes out. In fact, most recently, they thawed the fact that the magic bullet was actually placed on the, uh, the president's, um, uh, you know, whatever it is, they put the gurney, thank you, uh, by one of the Secret Service people. And, you know, that was just revealed 60 years later even though people have been talking about it since the mid 1960s and Jim Garrison proved that the magic bullet didn't add up. And, you know, up to a year ago, you'd still have people defending it. And now lo and behold, somebody goes forward and says, yeah, we put the magic bullet there on the gurney. So that's an example uh, of the revelation of the method. When you reach the freeze thaw portion, they start thawing out all the stuff that doesn't make sense. And they admit to you, yeah, we lied or yeah, we misled you. But by then it's too late. By the time they start giving you these truths, it's too late to do anything about it. Most of the people involved with the JFK assassination are dead. Right. Um, and the bloodlines that may have been involved are still being protected, uh, which is why they haven't declassified all of the JFK files, even though Trump told us he was going to. Um, uh, so so and, Tom, did you want to talk about the origin of that, uh, of, of oh. where the revelation of the method was coined? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, uh, the person who actually came up with this, and I want to make sure I pronounce his name correctly, is James Shelby Downard. And he wrote about the revelation of the method in a 1980s white paper uh, called King Kill 33 that was devoted exclusively to the Kennedy assassination. Um, and he tied in Masonic magic, and I'm not going to go into it. It's way too intricate. Um, I don't even fully understand it. I read it a couple times. It is some heavy, heavy stuff, but you can still walk away with a general understanding of what he's trying to tell you. Um, and he ties in all of the strangeness of the day and the place and whatever. I, like I said, I've already talked about it too much. From there, uh, James Shelby Downard was assisted by uh, a former Associated Press reporter named Michael Hoffman. Uh, who helped him write King Kill 33 and then later extrapolated upon the whole revelation of the method uh, uh, theory in a book called Secret Societies in Psychological Warfare, which came out in, I believe, the summer of 2001. Uh, and I cannot recommend that book highly enough. I mean, it's probably the five it? most, in, oh, sorry, it's, it's called Secret Societies in Psychological Warfare. Okay. And the name of the author is Michael Hoffman. He was an Associated Press reporter uh, in the state of New York. And, you know, and his story is like a lot of former journalists were like, you know, he started digging into this stuff. None of it made sense. Nobody at the AP wanted to hear about it because nobody in the mainstream ever wants to hear about the stuff that doesn't make sense. And so he followed his muse and he ended up writing um, Secret Societies and Psychological Warfare, which when it was published in July 2001, he literally predicted like, I don't know what it is, but these guys have got a massive traumatic event up their sleeves and it's going to hit before the end of the year uh, because 2001 is their kickoff year for, um, you know, the next era, you know, whatever you want to call it, transhumanism or whatever it is they've got up their sleeve. Oh, so that's it. The, the, I want to interject real quick. Please go right ahead. Go ahead. Um, about 20, probably 22 years ago, it was right around this time of year, it was October of 2001, um, I uh, was able to figure out that 9-11 was an inside job on the same day when I realized there was no air defense around the Pentagon. And I asked my friends at the time, when we played this game called uh, Warcraft 2, and in it, one of the very first things you have to do, and I asked the guys, what's the first thing you have to do besides like get your guys harvesting gold and trees and stuff? And they said, well, you got to build arrow towers. And I said, why? And they said, well, you need a static ground air defense because if the other guy does the very quick build out and gets dragons or griffin riders, he'll just annihilate you because you don't have a static air defense on the ground that can deal with an aerial attack. And I said, OK, where was the air defense around the Pentagon? And they all went. And they look down and like all oh, the blood drained out of their face. And then they go, no, 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 no. Oh, that would be the one that was in on it. And I said, it would certainly seem to strongly imply that, yes, 
but you haven't answered my question. And they just got super angry at me. And I was just like, oh, okay. And a few weeks later, uh, my uh, my weed dealer at the time said, hey, have you heard of these 9-11 conspiracy theories? And I was like, oh, my God, thank God, because, like, I didn't have anyone to talk to about it. And uh, I found um, I'd already known about William Cooper, and I found out that William Cooper had predicted it. He wrote uh, Behold a Pale Horse, uh, yep. unbelievable, unbelievable book, um, cool. Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars. We talked about that off camera earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, everyone should really go read that book and in particular where he predicted Columbine and other mass shootings before Columbine. Yep. Um, and, uh, he was killed, uh, in October, he was killed 22 years ago, uh, in his own home by a SWAT team after he had predicted 9-11. And then he said, this is the event I predicted and, you know, pinned it on the Bush administration, the deep state, whatever you want to call it. And they killed him in his home with the SWAT team. And then yep. all of his people went over to Alex Jones, who he said at the time was um, an intelligence asset. Now, I have mixed feelings about Alex Jones. I've refined my theory, and I believe Alex Jones is what I call a Luciferian, whereas the people that he's up against are Malachian. And so he's not evil, whereas I tend to think that William Cooper was more most high aligned. And that's part of why they killed him, was because mm-hmm. he was too pure and incorruptible, and they wanted to have some kind of hook in him. Um, and so... Uh, Around that time, I read uh, uh, Shelby. What what was the guy's name again? James Shelby Downer. I read a very short article he wrote called uh, "Sex, Sorcery, and Assassinations," and in it, he described that the eventual goal of these people who had done the um, the killing of the king ritual, which um, the whole Masonic thing, yes, it's the Malachian branch of the Masons killed a Luciferian branch of the Masons, which was Kennedy, was a Luciferian, in my opinion. And that's why they left a eternal flame at his grave, because it, he is a Luciferian and the eternal, like the light, the light bringer, right? So that was an acknowledgement of uh, of who Kennedy was by his own bloodline. And, I, you know, I see RFK Jr., at, you know, and that whole, that whole family is by and large Luciferian. And That's why they're the more reasonable among the politicians. Uh, But in that, he says that the goal of these people and what they're trying to do with all these occult activities is they're trying to turn people into what he referred to as cybernetic mystery zombies, which is essentially, if you remember the movie The Matrix, which has a lot of revelation the method in it, uh, the humans are used as batteries. But now imagine spiritual batteries instead, and not just batteries, but also amplifiers. Because one of the things I want to just say, and then I want to go into everything you have to say on this, is that there is uh, this phenomenon of the revelation of the method. Part of the reason they do it is because much like a computer hacker will hack a bunch of people's computers without them knowing it. And then they take all these zombie computers that they control kind of on almost a subconscious level, like the person who owns the computer doesn't know it's controlled. Right. And they use it to do a brute force DNS attack, which is one of the most devastating cyber attacks you can do. But it requires a vast network of computers that the average hacker would never have access to that many computers unless they take over all the minds of the computer. So when everybody watched that 2012 Olympic Games, for example, they all went, whoa, what the fuck was that, bro? And they're just were like, that was really weird and disturbing. But they didn't understand the symbolism that they were looking at at all even though there's dancing nurses and doctors, hmm, that was the big right. part of it. That's the most mind blowing part about that whole thing. Well, didn't they wheel out like a giant thing that looked like the virus with the little spiky thing sticking out of it? And what all? they had is they had everyone in the crowd held up LEDs based on their seat and it made the coronavirus. Yes. Right. So that's the other right. like mind boggling thing about it. It's exactly that image we've seen a million times of the spike proteins on the outside. And they also had a giant, another like telltale sign, this black magic. They had a giant skeletal guy in a yes. black robe with a wound, a <laughs> yes. wound. And this little kid on a on a gurn or a hospital bed gets floated up and is like all freaked out because there's a giant evil sorcerer. And then he had a giant boned wand and shot fireballs out of it. So everyone who saw that was like, exactly what in the actual fuck did that have to do with the Olympics? <laughs> right. And so it made a deep impression on their minds. And then they went about their day and watched the rest of the Olympics. And But it was stuck in their head now. And now all those people's minds are primed and hijacked to be used as amplifiers for the black magic spell that they're going to cast. 
Yes. So the yes. rest of it is very practical, but there is a there is an occult spiritual dynamic to this. And we're going to go mostly into the the more uh, practical, like psychological warfare, fifth generation warfare um, kind of stuff here. But I just wanted to interject that little bit of spiritual and the cybernetic mystery zombies. What they want, of course, the Malachians is they want to put a chip into people's brains so that way they can just use it to amplify magic forever and ever and ever and ever and have like these little slaves that amplify the magic. They're going to fail 100%. But that's their goal, the cybernetic mystery zombie. And when I read that 22 years ago, I just had that, this is true, even though this is the fucking craziest thing I've ever heard. Because just think back, were you really thinking about, like, brain chips 22 years ago? Most people would say no, right? No, no. And it was so, like a science fiction thing. Totally, uh, totally. But now it's a reality, right? Yes. It's getting right. closer and closer. And so, anyways... Please continue with how, how this works on the psychological level. And uh, you can jump off wherever you want um, mm -hmm. with some. Did, did, should we should we launch into some examples or do you want to lay a little well, more? No, I think I'd just like to, to touch on the, um, the effect of the psychological warfare and what its intent is uh, by telling you what they've done. You yeah. know, uh, and, uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm culling basically from Michael Hoffman's writings here right. on this, you know, so this is not my original thought. It just makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. um, so the first time you're traumatized is when the event happens. OK, so let's just take 9-11 again, for example. I mean, huge crush uh, of the American soul, uh, you know, attacked on our own land. Anyway, I'm not going to go into the detail over. We all know what it is. So over the years, as all the incongruities and sinister unanswered questions around 9-11 begin to leak out um, and people it dawns on them either first subconsciously and then consciously that oh my god this was a false flag attack or at least it certainly seems that way um, and and once people begin to grasp that it inspires two feelings one of them is a a type of helplessness Oh my God, I can't do anything about this. But even more insidiously, it inspires this sense of almost desire. Like, oh my God, I have figured out this, this horrific, horrific event, you know, from these masters of the universe who control our lives so intricately that there's this voyeuristic you know, like a like almost a dirty desire or a dirty lust underneath it to to have been brought into the horrors of the truth that lies underneath the event itself. Mm. So it's it's it, it does double damage to the psycholo the psychology of a nation. Uh, it first makes you feel helpless, and then also makes you feel like I'm part of this. You know, like this horrible thing. You know, which is why some people reject it. You know, like even once the truth is presented to them, they want might want to step back because one of two things happen. Either you gotta like kind of buy into it and play along with this wretched situation, or you know, guys like you, like me, like Michael Hoffman leaving the Associated Press, you know, great reputable job, you know, where you gotta do something about it. You know, I mean, so so that <laughs> you know, it's a hard thing to step by, and and like you said, I mean, you figured out. You say you said on nine eleven, like you knew right away it didn't make any sense. And even though I was confronted with all these facts on the day itself, September eleventh, two thousand and one, I rejected them for quite some time, for like a year, you know, until it just keeps building up and building up, and it becomes, you know, uh, you you can't deny it. But like even the day of the attacks, when they let Bush sit in that classroom for 20 minutes, I, you know, I'm talking to people at work. It was like, how did that even happen? These people are incompetent. You got to get the president out of there right away. Everybody knew he was at that school. How, you know, what are they doing? And of course, you know, now years later, we all realized because they all knew. They knew he wasn't in any trouble. They, they, you know, were part of what was going on. But at the time, you reject that. You know, it, it, you, you accept the fact that it was incompetent or... People panicked in the moment, and it's difficult to head, get your head around, you know, the horror, the horror. So that's the psychological, you know, portion of it. Um, and, uh, um, you know, I mean, you want to, like, speak to, like, specifics? And, and we can talk about, like, specific examples, and yet yeah, John Carpenter is a, a great example. Um, but, like, as, you know, I've mentioned to you in the past, like, I used to think 
you know, oh, everybody's, you know, in on this. You join this secret society and they give you this like calendar and this is how it's going to work out. And, you know, you got to play along and help them build their narrative. But I'm I'm no longer thinking that anymore. And it just gets like weirder and weirder. And, and as I, I had mentioned to you, you know, the, the one example I can't get away from is is the, the novel Futility, which was published in 1898. Uh, and it's about uh, it's it's a thriller about the world's greatest ocean liner, the world's largest ocean liner and fastest. And on its maiden voyage in 1898 in this fictional novel, it's in the North Atlantic. It strikes an iceberg and it sinks. And the name of the ship was the Titan. So I don't think that the 1912 sinking of the Titanic had been planned out 20 years in advance and they're giving their revelation right. of the method stuff it to... absolutely was because it was to create the federal reserve you know that right uh, i do i i don't dispute that that was probably part of this but i don't think that they were giving a revel of the ma revelation of the method heads up to the guy who wrote the book futility in 1898 i think I... They probably were that's just my opinion but that's uh yeah i i think but you know we don't have to agree on that. Anyways, please. No, no, no. I mean, look, I don't put anything past anybody anymore. But that would require oh, some really long con planning. Um, well, I mean, this is all like the thing you have to understand is that the Luciferians think in terms of centuries. Mm -hmm. They plan in terms of centuries. They have a hundred year plan in uh, you know China, and of course, you know, it's a, again the Malkins have been running everything, but they're consigliores, the people who do the planning are the Luciferians, and they're incredibly intelligent. And the the global banking cartel, like they're, they're the masters of long term planning, probably more so than anyone else. And they absolutely they tried to get it in with the first bank of the United States, and when we ended the contract on that, they burned Washington D.C. to the ground in the War of eighteen twelve. And basically said, you're putting in a goddamn uh, second bank in the United States or we'll just destroy your country. And so we did. And then Andrew Jackson came along and he said, I've discovered you guys are betting on the foodstuffs of the nation. And I know you say that if I destroy you, that 100 families will be destroyed or 1,000 families will be destroyed. And I say to you, if I let you continue, 100,000 families will be destroyed. So I'm going to route you out by the almighty. I'll route you out. And he destroyed the second bank in the United States. And they tried to assassinate him. Almost mm -hmm. every single presidential assassination attempt or success in the history of the United States, with basically the exception of Reagan, has something to do with banking and monetary policy, including JFK. They got rid of mm -hmm. silver coinage and circulation. And he had the United States notes replacing the Federal Reserve notes backed by silver again. That was the bridge that was too far. That's what got him killed. Sure, the U.S. Steel thing, I'm going to break the CIA, all that kind of stuff. Those are all JV stuff. He went to the pro leagues. You know, he went to the uh, Goodall at the NFL and was fucking with him, Roger Goodall, instead of the local high school varsity team. You know what I mean? Or JV team. Uh, yeah, I mean, that was a big one. I mean... Mm -hmm. You know, JFK was rattling so many cages, you know, and he was trying to keep Israel from getting the nuclear bomb. Yeah. There's talk that he was going to try some sort of disclosure with aliens or. Yeah. That, that one might have, I put some I put some uh, credence to especially that last one you mentioned, because that's the other. That's the ultimate secret. It's the ultimate secret. They hide above and beyond anything else is the ultra tech stuff. I don't even necessarily know if it's about aliens so much as that we already have anti-gravity and free energy and have had it forever mm -hmm. and that they were well on their way uh, even by that point, even by um, the time of Kennedy assassination. And so him opening that up would have taken that away from them. And, and you know, they wanted to keep that to themselves. So I'm definitely open and or just, you know, if there are aliens that are interacting with, and I think there are, I, I think... I think most of what people see is actually humans in the sky, like 98% of it when you see some kind of thing where it does a right degree right. Turn and goes accelerates 2,000 miles an hour. You're probably seeing a human operated craft and not an extraterrestrial, but I do allow for that. And I think it's possible and even likely. I think that might have got him killed, but every single president where there was an assassination attempt, if you look into the details, it had something to do with 
the then version of the Federal Reserve, which was the first couple of banks of whatever, all of them, McKinley, all of them, all of them. They had to do with right. that Zachary Taylor, all of them, like all of them until you get to Reagan had that. Oh, and um, what's his name? Uh, 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 Ford, because they did try to kill yeah. Ford with the, the idiot. The, the idiot um, guy. That was another one. And I think that that was more of a dry test run of using MK Ultra assassins or, you know, right. like continuing to refine that. Um, right. Because there's one of the Manson women. Right. Right. That's correct. You know, and, so and they Manson, were all... Back then they were doing MK Ultra in the California prisons and Manson saw it and he was either pulled in or he just learned their techniques and was doing it himself. It's, it's a little difficult to say. Um, but then they moved it into satanic cults because mm -hmm. then if anything happened and like the cops come in and they find a bunch of Satanists harming children, then, and those Satanists go, no, no, we're farmed out by the CIA for, for a mind control program. Please listen. And nobody's going to listen to them. Right. Prisoners were too credible. Prisoners in the California prison system were too credible. So they had to move it into the satanic cults. Right. That's I don't remember who it was, but um, Manson's handler in San Francisco was also the handler for somebody else who was a dangerous nut. I don't recall who it was, yeah, but it, it, it's, it's funny how the same names and people keep popping up over and over again. He was controlled more than likely that he was, uh, he was part of the MK Ultra program. But anyways, yeah. even though that's very related because we're talking about mind control and psychological warfare, we wandered pretty far off the Sorry, park. Yes. Yes. We were, we, we, we got off in this tangent because I was like, the book futility was a strange otherworldly coincidence or spirit moves foreshadowing and you're of the nope they, they they had this planned out for decades which you know i again right i wouldn't put anything past them I uh, mean, they've been putting the banking system into place and expanding it you know since the time of isaac newton so i mean <laughs> and i mean really really way before that with the venetians and way before that i mean it's really it, it's babylonian money magic i mean everything goes back to babylon it really really does when you trace all of this back everything we're talking about mind control dark sorcery uh fifth generation type warfare i mean psychological warfare isn't really actually new at all it's been like the right. primary modus operandi of these people since babylon mm -hmm. um and yep. so uh you know like even the t taking the jews in and and the uh the, the enslavement in babylon and the breaking the spirit of those people and so forth i mean that's all related i mean that's a very very deep rabbit hole but uh, yeah, I, I mean i do though I, i'm glad you touched on this because i think you know if there's one point that'd be great that everybody could walk away with today it's that certainly money is the greatest magic trick they've ever pulled Absolutely. you know i mean like they've, they've pulled the wool over the eyes of the entire planet people who realize it's a scam are forced to live in it like me like you you know um you got to use their money it's the only way you can operate and it's based on nothing yeah it's based on nothing now it's just based on air and you know if i can plug the late great Tracy Twyman, um, I think one of her only books that's still in print is Money Magic, uh, which or maybe it's called the, the Money Magic Tree, something like that. But again, that's another book I did not fully understand, but I got enough out of it to, to realize the immense power uh, that comes from being able to be the magicians who control finance. Yep. I mean, it's, it's astonishing. Uh, you know, it's, it's the greatest magic trick they've ever pulled. And it's the um, ultimate power, right? Because Rothschild yeah. said, I care not who sits, I, I care not who like the prime minister of England is or who sits on the throne. As long as I have control of the money supply, then right. I run everything. Yep. Right? Because you yep. just, like, if you can just literally print money, you know, or nowadays even better, just hit a, click a couple mouse clicks and then trillion dollars in an account. I mean, <laughs> most people like are like oh i would never join evil and it's like well what if someone approached you with 10 billion would you be right. like what? <laughs> let's game that out for a minute let's just get a little theoretical and i mean and you don't need to pay people five billion dollars or whatever to bribe them you can pay an assassin 500 grand to kill them you know right. what i mean like there's cheaper ways to do it and but and, uh, people are bought for much less than 10 billion too i mean it's like Put right. me on a reality show and, you know, I'll spout your vaccine propaganda. You know, I mean, people sell out cheap. People sell out cheap. Absolutely. So. I know. And so if you have infinite money, I mean, you can you 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 can uh, 
it's human energy. I mean, it's really, it's the human energetic system. And, you know, not all, I do want to just say one of the things that's been interesting to me over the past few years and shows that I I was stuck in that, what I call the chaotic duality of Malachian mindset of where people are either good or they're bad and there's kind of no in between. And, you know, if I see someone do, do something incongruent with goodness, that means they're automatically part of this cabal if they have power or wealth or whatever. I've actually met people now who, um, you know, have worked in, who were like a contractor for the CIA, someone who was a banker. And like, I assure you, these are good people. I'm 100% certain. They're, of course, pretty much against the institutions they came out of and they saw it be corrupted. Right. But in particular, I was surprised to find that there was a number of people who were in banking who were actually in very high level banking. And they were uh, actually totally reasonable people. And what the angels told me is that bankers um, have the mandate to move energy flows around the planet where it needs to go. And that during the Kali Yugas that we're in, this low ebb of consciousness, that's going to mean that that energy gets routed to people who are, um, you know, mostly doing bad stuff. But that's changing with the Yugas and that there's more and more people who are going to be directing it towards, you know, uh, these comparatively far more... um, humanitarian anyway luciferian false light but still at least it's improved well-being of humanity it's not harming the kids epstein style stuff like that and so um you know even even all bankers aren't evil and and people really need to be careful with painting with a broad brush that everyone's evil like we mentioned uh the masons earlier and everybody likes to see masons under every bed or whatever for some people it's the jesuits or for other people it's you know, the Jewish people or whatever. And that gets people trapped in these, like everyone in this group that isn't my group, it's always not my group. They're all evil, all of them from top to bottom. And it's like, what group have you ever been involved in where there's a hundred people to where every single person is good or every single person is evil? Like we're humans. Sure. In any group of a hundred, just statistically, you're going to have about three sociopaths, right? And who's going to rise to the top in the power pyramid? It's going to be sociopaths. So I would I would point out that at the top of pretty much every power structure on earth, including Christian, Muslim, Jewish, Hindu, everything, it's chock full of sociopaths and psychopaths. Yes. Yeah. Because yeah. that's just the way that the Kali Yuga power structures work. And so I just want to say that um, <clears throat> while I agree with uh, Downer that the, and Shelby Downer that, that that was absolutely a killing of the king ritual bring it back to the 33 king kill or whatever it was um you know they built up jfk as camelot right and yes and all that kind of stuff before they they offed him um for martin luther king too you know i mean there's another you know great leader he's got it like right in his name of course they're gonna kill him you know i mean mm-hmm. i don't know about a course but like it just fits the same pattern people like that are targets they're great courageous leaders mm-hmm. and if you're looking to break the will of the people you know, it, it carries both covert and subtextual power. That's Pardon me. that's so well put. So I want to do a little bit more of talking just a little bit more about setup. And then we'll um, take a break. And we'll have a part two. And I want to get into examples, especially I want to talk about um, uh, the one of the directors, I think, is actually a good person or at least Luciferian. Right. Which, again, those are far better in Hollywood. Most people are Malachian. Right. So a Luciferian is a step in the right direction, consciousness wise, even if they're not where we hope we ourselves and humanity is going towards a more harmonious, you know, golden age, most high type thing. Uh, and that is ju- the films of John Carpenter. And then I'm going to talk about what I think is the single most important revelation of the method film ever uh, in part two. But for the next few minutes, um, did you just want to round things out? Because it kind of... Uh, I like having a flowing conversation. Yeah, no, it's, it's, great. it's great. It's great. We were talking about um, futility in 1898. And then did you, w- were there some more things you want to hit on about um, freeze thaw and maybe? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I mostly brought up futility. Mm-hmm. Um, and then my, my point was disputed. And, uh, you know, so like, I don't know that it carries through. And I'm not, I'm not trying to slam you. I'm just like saying like the, the point I was trying to get at I don't know that it carries over to my next logical extrapolation, um, I, which was, I think, in some cases, uh-huh. we I don't think futility was written knowing about the Titanic thing. So let's just put that aside, no, because when it right. comes to like things like 9-11 and the destruction of the Twin Towers, I think we were given specific warnings ahead of time 
by people who knew what was going on. And, yeah. you know, my favorite example of that is uh, the week that they started building the uh, Twin Towers in New York. Um, I don't, it was the late 60s. I don't recall precisely. Uh, but it was on the cover of Newsweek. And they had David Rockefeller, who was behind the building of it. And he's sitting there and he's smiling, looking at the camera. And like the hands of his watch are on 9 and 11. Wow. Like the big hand is on the 11 and the little hand is on the 9 or vice versa. I don't remember what it was. But like it's just like right there facing the camera. His, his like watch, Rockefeller, says, you know, big hand 9, little hand 11. You know, I've never or heard vice that versa. There's yeah, I mean, you can find it up. People have it. People have that news recover. And actually, oh if God. you look on the back, it's got like a cigarette ad where the two L's are like pulled out specifically and they're much bigger than everything else. And it looks like the Twin Towers it's on the back cover of that Newsweek edition. Um, you know, maybe we can even slip it into this thing. Oh, I'll find or give a link to it or something. I yeah, never... I'll help you find it. I'll help you find it. Okay. Um, uh, and, and so that's just one example. But there were tons of examples of the Twin Towers being destroyed, um, including hit by planes. There was there were like I mean, there was another ad that had a picture of the Twin Towers and a plane flying right towards it to actually promote an airline. I don't remember which was, you know, I mean, it, it obviously wasn't in the ad supposed to hit the towers, but it just looked like that. So you've got that. And then the event itself happens and all sorts of incongruities occur. And then, you know, as soon as like a couple of weeks later, they start leaking out this stuff that makes no sense, you know, like to people who are critically thinking like, oh, these things burn to a crisp, but we happen to find the hijacker's passport, you know, a block away, you know, <laughs> which is which is like as in your face as it can get. I mean, hey, we're lying to you, but nobody calls them on it. You know, nobody in the news. I mean, that was, you know, it's crazy. And well, gee, that seems pretty odd to me, you know, I mean, and the stories that disappear, too. I remember and I can't find the story anymore. They claim like they found an engine to one of the planes, like wedged between two buildings. You know, and that story came out like a crazy amount later, like three months later, like, oh, we found this engine wedged between two buildings. And, uh, you know, I don't know that you can find that story anymore. Um, you know about uh, the elevator repair, right? That they were doing elevator repairs. Yes. Yes. Right. Which yes, where they enabled them to like shut down the power. They shut the power down to like fix stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah. that's when they got to plant all the thermite in the in the like those central steel columns, right? Yeah, and there was even presumably. Like, I mean, you know, there's any number of yeah um, it, it theories kind of, about like what happened. I mean, I, I honestly don't know. I mean, it's like that's a that's fair. Something crazy was done. That's fair. You know, th those buildings to me look like they turned to dust. Yeah, you know I mean? there's like, the dude. They look like they turned to dust. They don't look to me even like a the building seven looks like a controlled demolition yeah that's true you know buildings one and two they yeah. go to dust oh, man i mean too like with yeah tremendous tremendous force to where it was yeah jagged so, eye beams uh, were like you know 10 stories tall flying through the air yeah like, that's serious force whatever is causing it yeah there's people who say the dr judy Wood woodward or whatever woodruff um I don't know if I buy into it. I'm very, I'm always very leery of sexy conspiracy theories because right. like people said there was hologram planes. I know people right. were in New York. They felt the like of the right. plane at sea level, that shaking of the air. Like I don't buy for a second that there was hologram planes. No. Um, 9 11 is when they first started to realize we need to really um, put out lots of bullshit, sexy conspiracy theories. And so, you know, mini nukes in the basement, um, uh, hologram planes, which I heard from someone I know for a fact uh, was a government agent, right? Uh, he told me right after it that there was hologram planes. And I was like, that just doesn't make any sense at all. That's insane. And this guy was like the, the leader of the people who uh, rioted during the World uh, Trade Organization riots in 1999. He took mm. what was this coming together of environmentalists and trade unions and uh, you know, all people all across this, uh, of various different stripes who were against the World Trade Organization and the globalists, right? And then he and his crew started like breaking down McDonald's and Starbucks and they said, oh, we need to have martial law and blah, 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 because of these people. And then he got interviewed 
by CBS or whatever, all these different things. And they let him say his whole anti-capitalist thing, you know, all over the media, which they never used to let that kind of stuff in at all. And then that guy also uh, tried to convince me and other people to go do uh, property destruction acts uh, in Eugene uh, in the early 2000s. And I was like, Hmm. this guy is not on the level. And then now I'm just I'm convinced that guy was an operative. Uh, But anyways, um, boy, I just while while you're on that, I just I think there's a an interesting point to be made here just about how they run their disinfo campaigns. Like I uh, I'd had little doubt that planes hit the World Trade Center. But I have a great deal of doubt that a plane hit the Pentagon. Oh, so yeah. by meshing these two narratives together, mm-hmm. you know, if you can control the narrative, you can get the people on both sides. Mm-hmm. For the people who are like, oh, there were no planes at the Pentagon, you then extrapolate that into, oh, there are no planes at the World Trade Center either. You know, and then you get the whole no planes thing taken off the ta- table, you know, where like in the, in the inversion like if i'm like oh well then planes did hit the world trade center they then are able to lop that back into the a plane hit the pentagon and right. then if you said a plane didn't hit the pentagon well you're you know you're crazy because obviously they hit the world trade center you right. know so right. um uh it, it's it's all of these things have multiple moving parts and they try to maximize it in every way mm-hmm. to turn arguments back upon themselves and and win both sides of it um but I mean, you know, to anybody listening, I would just say they've got tons of footage of those planes hitting the World Trade Center. They still have not shown us a frame of a plane hitting the Pentagon, even though it is the most surveilled building on the planet or so we're told. A hundred percent. Yeah, that was one of the things that was, you know, I tried to say to my friends. It's so funny. I pushed so hard that my own and I love them. I love them dearly. And if by some weird quirk of fate they decide to watch my channel, I'm sure they're everything <laughs> nuts. But um, my brothers still don't, uh, uh, they still buy the official story of 9 11. They're some of the only adults I know. And it's because I pushed way too hard too early. And they just mm. responded by going <laughs> to where right. they're like, there's absolutely no way because. F our older brother Ian, like, so sick of his ranting, conspiracy theory stuff. Plus, that's really scary if he's right, you know, which right, I want right. to end with something here and then we'll uh, we'll do part two and you and okay. I, I'll, I'll just send you a new link and we'll go from there. But I want to talk about something very important. So, you know, Tom and I are talking about and, and I'm going to re- actually repeat this briefly, maybe. In, well, no, I won't repeat it in part two. I'll just say you need to watch it and hear about the Stockdale Paradox in part one. There's this thing called the Stockdale Paradox and I read it in this great uh, Jim Collins book called uh, Good to Great about uh, it's it's actually a business book. Um, Really good. If you have your own business, everyone should read it. Just absolutely fantastic. Uh, But he talks about the Stockdale Paradox and it goes like this. There was a a gentleman named uh, he eventually became an admiral, Admiral James Bond Stockdale, and he was the highest ranking officer in the Hanoi Hilton, the infamous Hanoi Hilton. That was the North Vietnamese black site torture pit uh where john mccain also was but he outranked john mccain and i believe that john mccain uh unfortunately because of what happened to him i think he was very easy to manipulate and that's why he ended up getting so much uh power and ended up being on you know on board with every war and i'm certainly not excusing what he did but i have a slight bit of sympathy because his psyche was cracked in this whole mk ultra thing we've been talking about and alluding to in this and i think they use that to manipulate him well stockdale was able to keep his uh, his honor and integrity, in my opinion, although maybe there's something I've missed about him. doesn't really matter. Regardless, he was the uh, <clears throat> highest ranking officer in the Hanoi Hilton, and he very famously kept everyone together. And he was being interviewed by Jim Collins in this book, and they said, well, how did you get out of there? How did you not go insane? Because he was just reading um, the book that Stockdale and his wife wrote afterwards, And he was getting so anxious and upset and freaking out. And he knew the end result. He knew Stockdale would get out. He knew that Stockdale would become this famous person, you know, that he was even going to interview and was like revered. You know, he was very revered by the boomer generation. Um, uh, You know, just total war hero. And even knowing that, Collins was still sweating bullets and freaking out reading this story. He was getting so immersed in being in the Hanoi Hilton. And... He's like, how did you survive that? And he said, well, um, 
I almost never had doubt that we'd get out. And when I did, I'd push through it and rediscover my faith. I knew we would get out. I was utterly certain of it. I didn't know how. I didn't know when. I knew all of us who could survive would get out. And that's why I decided I had to make sure that everyone survived that possibly could. And they said, he said, huh, well, who didn't make it? And he said, oh, that's easy. The optimists, which shocked Jim Collins. He was like, what do you mean the optimists didn't make it? Like, that sounds very optimistic what you just said. Oh, he said, oh, no, no, you don't understand. The optimists thought we'd get out by Thanksgiving and then Thanksgiving would come and go. We'll get out by Christmas and Christmas come and go. We get out by the 4th of July and it come and go. We'll get out before my birthday. We'll come and go. And <clears throat> because the days passed, they all died of a broken heart. They gave up. They succumbed to the torture and ended up dying because they just, their morale was broken, right? And remember, a big part of this fifth generation warfare, you know, it's the black pill. That's why I'm so adamantly opposed to the black pill on this channel is because it's the Venetian black nobility. It's their primary weapon is to destroy the morale of the enemy. Because if you destroy the morale of the enemy in warfare, you're going to win. It doesn't matter if you're yeah. outnumbered three to one. If the uh, if the morale breaks on the other side, you can overcome incredible odds. Uh, conversely, if you keep your morale up, you can overcome incredible odds. And that's what he did. But the optimists, they weren't looking at the situation they were in. And so he said, I always confronted the brutal facts that we would be in here for. I didn't know how long. I thought it might be many years. I thought it might be longer than when we actually got out. I didn't have any doubt about that I was in a torture pit. I confronted that every day. And at the same time, I had utter certainty that we would get out of it. And so I really encourage everyone watching this, adopt that frame. Adopt that frame. Hold both. Don't get too sucked into, I know where this, this particular episode is about a very dark subject matter. And it can be quite disheartening. But... While we can look at all this stuff, we don't need to get bogged down and 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 blackpill ourselves. I was blackpilled for like a decade, especially knowing all the stuff that I discovered through the through the grace of the angels and the most high, oh, that didn't feel much like grace back then. Uh discovering it this stuff in 2001, 2002, the Bush family and the Nazis, all the stuff. You know, I did a whole student film on the Bush family and the Nazis in 2002. So dark, and it almost broke my spirit, but somehow I just because of what I survived in my childhood, I was able to somehow push through that. I knew somehow, some way that goodness would win, but it was very, very dark for me at that time. You don't need to go that dark, right? We're talking about dark stuff here, and you can you can blackpill yourself by focusing too much on that. We're talking about it here because it's it's important for people to understand this principle, and Tom has an excellent grasp on it, and he has fantastic examples, and that's what we're going to talk about in part two. But what I want to encourage you is learn enough about this to keep yourself and your family safe. But if you need to know every little detail about what they did on Epstein's Island or, you know, any of that kind of stuff, it, it, it's going to sap away at you. So be sure that you also keep this utter faith that we will succeed because I will tell you, we, we will succeed. The Malachians will be overthrown. This doesn't mean instantly golden age, right? The Luciferians are going to take over and that'll be a whole different challenge for humanity for the next 6,000 years, but <laughs> it's going to be so much better than what we've been dealing with the past 6,000 years. And so I just want everyone to really embrace that Stockdale paradox. We can't lie to ourselves and pretend like nothing bad is happening. We have to confront the brutal facts but you also don't want to dwell on the brutal facts because that'll end up blackpilling you. But you need to simultaneously have that faith and knowledge and just know at the depths of your soul that, that they will be defeated. We're going to get through this. And especially you and your family will get through this. And then from that place, the actions you need to take will kind of come automatically. But if, <laughs> if you ever lose this, that faith, you will be lost. And so I'm telling you, as someone who's been so far down the rabbit hole, I popped out the other end. <laughs> you don't need to do that. I happen to have a very strong psychology for that, to where I was able to do that. I have Pluto right on my ascendant from an astrological point of view, zero degrees conjunct, and Pluto's the journey through the underworld. I did it, so you don't have to. <laughs> right. Do it. Well, I mean, again, it's, it's yeah. like you're literally explaining uh 
you know, the blue pill versus the red pill versus the black pill, you know, and don't the take the black pill and the white pill. Right? Okay. There you go. The white pill is, is, are the optimists, I guess. The well, blue pill are the people who are detached and oblivious. The black pill are the people who have given up. The red pill are the people who are accepting our situation, recognizing it and pressing forward. Yeah. And I mean, I, I would say the white pill are not actually optimists. I would say that they're people who just are certain that we're going to win, which is optimistic in a certain sense. But the white pill doesn't necessarily mean I, I see red pill and blue pill are the first choice. And then once you take the red pill, you have the choice of the black pill or the white pill from the red pill. Okay. It's like a branching. The blue pill, it just everything stops. You go back to your life. You go back in denial. You vote Biden. You think it's OK <laughs> for you think it's okay for uh, trans women to uh, wag their ass in front of kids. You just, you think we should have unlimited people streaming across the Southern border, you know, despite the fact that the cartels are doing it and all the human rights atrocities that are happening on the border. You just do whatever Mr. TV man says, no matter if it contradicts what Mr. TV man said yesterday, doesn't matter. <laughs> That's the blue pill. So um, yeah, those people are, are lost unless and until something shakes them out of that. But, um, Tom, this is a great place to pause and then we can get into in the second half. Time out. Tom and I are going <laughs> to Tom and I are going to discuss. Um, we're both into John Carpenter quite a lot. Um, we're going to talk about some of his films. We're going to talk about what I think is the, the most important revelation of the method film ever. Um, and we're just going to kind of go into some more concrete examples and explore this concept of the revelation the method even more so thank you so much and if you got this far if you want to hit like subscribe and and smash that bell so that way you be sure to uh catch every white lotus of light upload when it comes on uh that would be awesome and uh for for us it'll be just a couple minutes here tom and for everyone else it'll be one week and then part two yeah thank you All right see you shortly